Chapter Seven of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume Four, by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven gives an exact account of what happened in the family of Mister Munden after the lamentable and deplorable death of his lady's favourite squirrel, with several other particulars, much less significant yet very necessary to be told. If Mr. Munden had set his whole invention to work in order to find the means of rendering himself hateful in the eyes of his wife, he could not have done it more effectually than by his savage treatment of her beloved squirrel. Many circumstances, indeed, concurred to set this action of his in the most odious light that could possibly be given it. In the first place, the massacre of so unhurtful a little creature who never did anything to provoke its fate, had something in it strangely splenatic and barbarous. In the next, the bloody and inhuman deed being perpetrated by this injurious husband, merely in opposition to his wife, and because he knew it would give her some sort of affliction, was sufficient to convince her that he took pleasure in giving pain to her and also made her not doubt, but he would stop at nothing for that purpose, provided it were safe and came within the letter of the law. It grieved her to be deprived of a little animal she so long had kept, with whose pretty trick she had so often been diverted, and it must be confessed that to be deprived of so innocent a satisfaction by the very man she had looked upon as bound by all manner of ties to do everything to please her, was enough to give the most galling reflections to a woman of her delicacy and spirit. But there was still another, and by many degrees a more aggravating motive for her indignation. If she had purchased this squirrel with her own money, or if it had been presented to her by any other hands than those of Mr. Trueworth, not only the loss would have been less shocking to her, but also the person by whom she sustained that loss would perhaps have found less difficulty in obtaining her forgiveness. She kept her promise, however, and ordered a bed to be made ready for her in another room. Mr. Munden came not home that night till very late, and being told what his wife had done, took not the least notice of it, but happening to meet her the next morning, as she was coming downstairs. "'So, madam,' said he, "'I suppose you fancy this obstinate disobedience to your husband?' is mighty becoming in you. When a husband, answered she, is ignorant of the regard he ought to have for his wife, or forgets to put it in practice, he can expect neither affection nor obedience, unless the woman he has married happens to be an idiot. They passed each other with these words, and she went directly to Lady Trusty, being impatient to acquaint her with the behaviour of her husband towards her since she last had seen her. This worthy lady was astonished beyond measure at the recital. It seemed so strange to her that a gentleman of Mr. Munden's birth, fortune, and education should ever entertain the sordid design of obliging his wife to convert to the family uses what had been settled on for her own private expenses, that she could not have given credit to it from any other mouth than that of the weeping sufferer. His killing of the squirrel also, though a trifle in itself, she could not help thinking denoted a most cruel, revengeful, and mean mind. But how much soever she condemned him in her heart, she forbore expressing the whole of her sentiments on this occasion to his wife, being willing, as they were joined to each other, by the most sacred and indissoluble bonds, rather to heal, if possible, the breach between them, than to add anything which might serve to widen it. She told her that though she could not but confess that Mr. Munden had behaved towards her through this whole affair in a manner very different from what he ought to have done, or what might have been expected from him, yet she was sorry to find that she had carried things to that extremity. Particularly she blamed her for having quitted his bed. Because, said she, it may furnish him with some matter of complaint against you and likewise make others suspect you have not the affection for him, which is the duty of a wife. Mrs. Munden made no answer to this, and looking a little perplexed. 
"'I do not mean by what I have said,' resumed Lady Trusty, "'to persuade you to make any mean steps towards a reconciliation. "'That is, I would not have you confess you have been in the wrong, "'or tell him you are sorry for what you have done. "'That would be taking a blame upon yourself you do not deserve. "'And he would imagine he had a right to expect the same "'on every trifling occasion. "'It may be he might be imperious and ill-natured enough to create quarrels, merely for the sake of humbling your spirit and resentment into submissions. But as to live in the manner you are likely to do together, continued she, cannot but be very displeasing in the eye of heaven, and must also expose both of you to the censure and contempt of the world, when once it comes to be known and talked of. Some means must be speedily found to bring about an accommodation between you. Oh, madam, cried the other, hastily interrupting her, how impossible is it for me ever to look with anything but disdain and resentment on a man who, after so many protestations of eternal love, eternal adoration, has dared to treat me in this manner? No, added she, with greater vehemence than before. I despise the low, the grovelling mind. Light and darkness are not more opposites than we are, and can as easily agree. You must not think, nor talk in this fashion, said the good lady. All you can accuse him of will not amount to a separation. Besides, consider how odd a figure a woman makes who lives apart from her husband. There is an absolute necessity for a reconciliation, and as it is probable that neither of you will pursue any measures for that purpose, it is highly proper your friends should take upon them to interpose in the affair. It was a considerable time before Mrs. Munden could be persuaded, by all the arguments Lady Trusty made use of, that either her duty, her interest, or her reputation required she should forgive the insult she had received from this ungrateful and unworthy husband. The good lady would not, however, give over, till she had prevailed on her, not only to listen to her reasons, but also to be at last perfectly convinced by them. This point being gained, the manner in which the matter should be conducted was the next thing that employed her thoughts. It seemed best to her that the two Mr. Thoughtlesses should not be made acquainted with any part of what had passed. If the business she so much wished to see accomplished could be effected without their knowledge, her reason for it was this. They were both men of pretty warm dispositions, especially the younger, and as they had been so assiduous in promoting this match, so early a breach and the provocations given for it by Mr. Munden might occasion them to show their resentment for his behaviour in a fashion which would make what was already very bad much worse. Sir Ralph is a man in years, said she, has been your guardian, and I am apt to believe that on both these accounts his words would have some weight with Mr. Munden. The friendship which he knows is between us will also give me the privilege of adding something in my turn, and I hope by our joint mediation this quarrel may be made up, so far at least as that you may live civilly together. Mrs. Munden made no other reply to what her ladyship had said than to thank her for the interest she took in her affairs and the trouble she was about to give Sir Ralph on her account. The truth is, this young lady would in her heart have been much better satisfied that there had been a possibility of being separated for ever from a person, who she was now convinced had neither love nor esteem for her, rather than to have consented to cohabit with him as a wife, even though he should be prevailed upon to request it in the most seemingly submissive terms. While they were in this conversation, a message came from Mr. Edward Goodman, containing an invitation to Sir Ralph and Lady Trusty, to an entertainment that gentleman had ordered to be prepared the next day for several of his friends, on a particular occasion which, because the reader as yet is wholly ignorant of it, is highly proper he should be made acquainted with. End of chapter 7